thanks PJ for bringing us a journey from the Mediterranean to Balsaskin and the context of HIV. And once again, we, we will have the opportunity to ask PJ some questions. Um, let's press on. Our next speaker is Dr. Patrick Murphy, who's an assistant professor in occupation therapy and radiation therapy with Trinity College Dublin, based in St. James's Hospital. And amongst his publications, Patrick co-authored with David Hebe an article titled The Relationship Between Internalized HIV-Related Stigma and Post-Traumatic Growth in the Journal AIDS and Behaviour. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Patrick introduce his topic. Thank you. Just while we're getting that up. Um, so I'm a health psychologist working in the School of Medicine in Trinity College Dublin. And uh, it often strikes me as strange that I have chosen a profession that requires me to speak in public because I am terrified by it. Um, <laughs> I think as a psychologist, it means that I have a subconscious desire to torture myself, but be that as this may, so, so bear with me today. So today I'm going to talk about HIV, social inclusion, and the gay community in Ireland. So my research interests since I started studying and, and researching in this area um, around 2009, 2010, has been sex and sexuality for people living with chronic illnesses. Um, and of the publications that I've had so far, a lot of them, or maybe about half, have been about uh, gay men living with HIV and their experiences of disclosure in the context of casual sex and, and some other things like post-traumatic growth, which, which we'll mention again. Um, but not all of them. I've worked with people with living with cardiovascular disease and other populations as well. Uh, but the work that I did with gay men living with HIV, that was done as part of my HDIP in Trinity and as part of my PhD. So when I was thinking about the, the remit for this talk that Niall sent me, uh, it was about thinking about uh, my own experience in this area, what I could say about the, the population that I was asked to speak about, uh, the gay community, and what I think should be done. Were there any gaps in service provision that I could identify? So I tried to use this model of reflection that we call the, the what, so what, now what model. So I was trying to think about what, meaning, you know, what are, or what is the, the state of affairs with gay men and HIV uh, from the biomedical model. Um, so what, meaning, so what are the implications for people living with HIV in this country, and now what, as in, now what should be done about that. So to begin with, now what? Um, what I'd like to begin with is just some data that is available from the Health Protection Surveillance Centre in Ireland. And this is from their EMI toolkit, which is a resource for uh, medical professionals to decide if somebody living or somebody who has been exposed to HIV should get uh, emergency post-exposure prophylaxis. So one of the tables in there highlights uh, transmission risk based on the prevalence uh, of the group uh, that the uh, person living with HIV comes from and the risk of exposure for the different types of exposure. So a couple of numbers that I'd like to highlight. Um, the first is the estimated prevalence of HIV among MSM in this country, which is 8%, and the estimated prevalence of uh, HIV among heterosexuals in this country, which is 0.15%. And this data is a little bit old at this time, and I, I didn't come up with this, so I'm slightly afraid of misinterpreting it, but it does suggest that the, there's a huge difference in prevalence between uh, gay men, men who have sex with men, and heterosexual in this, heterosexuals in this country. Um, so the prevalence is, prevalence is 53 times greater among gay men in this country. So that's a huge, huge, huge disparity. And the other numbers I'd like to look at here are at the risk of transmission. Um, if two men are having sex and one of them is HIV positive, and the assumption here is that they're not uh, on effective antiretroviral medication that they wouldn't have uh, an undetectable viral load. So the risk, if they're having unprotected anal sex, the risk of transmission would be about one in a thousand. So in about one in a thousand instances of unprotected anal sex between men, when, where one partner is HIV positive and the other is not, but in one case in one thousand, transmission will occur. And the other number then is the transmission risk for unprotected sex between heterosexuals, a man and a woman. Uh, where a condom isn't used and uh, say the man has uh, HIV but that is uncontrolled and the woman does not. So the risk is about 1 in 700,000. So this means that there's a huge, again, disparity between the risk for transmission if you're looking at gay men or if you're looking at heterosexuals. So the risk is 700 times greater. So 
we have a, a much higher prevalence rate among gay men, we have a much higher risk of transmission, and that is reflected in the incidence data that the Health Protection Surveillance Center publishes every year. So this graph shows new infections uh, in this country from the years 2003 to the year, uh, last year, 2016. And the line in blue is MSM, or gay men mostly. And you will see that this uh, line is increasing. There's some noise, it goes up and down a little bit, but uh, on the whole, it's increasing year on year, every year. And gay men make up a tiny proportion of the population in this country, but they make up about half of all new diagnoses at this time, and that's pretty consistent. So the burden of HIV on gay men is overwhelming. It is not really comparable to the heterosexual community or to many other communities in this country. So that's the what, that's the biomedical reality of HIV in this country at the moment as it relates to gay men. But so what? So what are the implications of this for people living with HIV, for gay men living with HIV in particular? So the first piece of research I did was looking at post-traumatic growth um, among pe people living with HIV. And post-traumatic growth is, it was kind of mentioned earlier today about the positive things that could happen as a result of HIV infection, you know, the beneficial outcomes that could happen as a result of that. Like, you know, that old phrase, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, this is an attempt to put kind of a, a scientific stamp on that. So um, what we did in this study, and uh, David Hebe was my supervisor for my PhD in Trinity, uh, but this came from my HDIP. Um, we looked at the relationship between post-traumatic growth and HIV-related stigma among um, about 100 people living with HIV in this country. And it wasn't limited to gay men. There was heterosexuals included in the sample. There was uh, intravenous drug users. Um, so it was, it was just open to anybody who was living with HIV. So this was the main output from that. I'm not even sure if you can see that, but it's not really important to look at the numbers. This is uh, a few different uh, multiple linear regressions uh, predicting the different uh, post-traumatic growth outcomes. And what uh, we would take away from that, uh, just looking at all those numbers, is simply that internalized HIV-related re stigma inhibits post-traumatic growth. And that's not really a surprise because we know that stigma kind of inhibits any kind of beneficial outcome of infection. That's not really a surprise. What was surprising was uh, what happened when we broke down the data according to transmission route. So if we compared people who were infected via male and female sexual contact, if we compared them to those who were infected via male-male sexual contact, there was a clear disparity across all the different outcomes of post-traumatic growth. So RTO is relating to others, NP is new possibilities, PS is uh, personal strength, um, SC is spiritual change, AOL is appreciation of life, and PTG was the whole uh, instrument itself, post-traumatic growth. So you'll see there in the blue, essentially we've got gay men having poorer outcomes than those in the gray, essentially heterosexuals. So right across the board, poorer outcomes for gay men across all of these, all of these uh, outcomes. And why is that? So I think it really is simply down to that concept of layered stigma that we've already heard mentioned today. So you have the moral hierarchy of HIV infection. And at the top of that hierarchy, those who are judged to be kind of stigma free, um, are those who are judged to be the innocent victims of the HIV epidemic. So we're talking about people who were born HIV positive or who became infected through an accidental exposure like a, a needle stick. But that term, innocent victims, is, is really highly problematic because it implies that there are also guilty victims who are rightly deserving of blame and stigmatization. And so as you move down this hierarchy, there is more blame and more stigmatization assigned for the fact of, or the fact of being HIV positive or for infection. So the next piece of research that I did, and I'm not going to go into the details of that either, um, we were looking at optimism, community attachment, and serious status disclosure among HIV positive men who have sex with men. So there was myself and David there. Siobhan Dean, Anthony Rahal, and Fiona Mulcahy were all at the Guy Clinic, and Fiona was the, one of the lead consultants there, and she very kindly gave us permission to do this research, and she supported me throughout the PhD, which was fantastic. Um, so without going into too much detail about what we were looking at, I just want to draw your attention to one of the constructs we were looking at, which was gay community attachment. And this was the degree to which a person who was um, taking part in the study, and this was all gay men in the study, the degree to which they were embedded within the gay community. And we called this gay community attachment. And we assessed it very simply by um, putting forth these three statements. Most of my friends are gay or bisexual men. I spend most of my time with gay or bisexual men. I spend a lot of time at organizations that support men. Disagree strongly to agree strongly on the kind of scale that you've all seen a million times before. And when we put that into our 
complex statistical model. This is a multinomial logistic regression predicting disclosure pattern. Uh, I'd like you to look at this line here, GCA is again gay community attachment, and I'd like you to look at the second last column there, that's the odds ratio, and the number of interest is 1.85. And what this simply means is that um, for each incremental increase in agreement with the statements on the previous slide, there was an 85% increase in the likelihood that any participant in the study would be classified as a non-disclosure, non-discloser in the context of casual sex between men. Now, I'm going to say that in another way because I think that's quite complex. But the more, um, the more a person agreed with the statement that most of their friends were gay or bisexual men, the more time a participant spent with gay or bisexual men, and the more time a participant spent at organizations that support gay men, the less likely it would be that that person would ever have disclosed their HIV status to the gay men they had sex with. Now, why would that be the case? So, was it just irrelevant? Would it be like disclosing to a prospective casual partner that you just had athlete's foot? Uh, is it something that they weren't going to care about and you were just going to kill the mood? Uh, or was there something more going on? So, fortunately, we were able to ask people about that because the last question in that survey that we gave out as part of this study was, would you be willing to be interviewed about your experience of talking about or not talking about your HIV status with sex partners? Interviews would be strictly private and confidential and would be arranged for a time that suits your schedule. Yes, no, or I need more information before deciding. Now, this interview study that we're proposing in this question, will you come and talk to me about your disclosure pra practices? Um, this was the study that I originally wanted to do. So when I approached Fiona Mulcahy, the consultant in the Guy Clinic, this is what I wanted to go and do. And, and she advised me and our team advised me very, uh, you know, very cautiously uh, don't go into the clinic and do this because nobody will do it. Get together a little questionnaire survey that you can give out in the ward. People will be happy to do that because it's anonymous. Uh, they don't need to get involved too much. Nobody is going to want to talk to you personally about their own disclosure practices because, well, number one, they'll have to come in at another time. They can't do this during their routine clinic visit. They're going to have to take time off work or off college to come in and do that. They're not going to want to talk to you about something that is possibly seen as morally reprehensible if they're not disclosing. They're not going to want to tell you if they're not disclosing and possibly putting other people at risk of, infe of infection if they have, don't have an undetectable viral load. They're not going to want to talk to you about something that's possibly prosecutable. Nobody's going to sign up for this study. However, when we gave out the questionnaire and about 100 people, I think 97 people, completed that questionnaire, of those 97, 57 people said, yes, I would like to be interviewed about this. And the most that I could interview, the most that I wanted to interview or could possibly interview was 15. So this was way above and beyond the response that I needed, and it was actually a bit of a pain in the ass, because when people said yes, I had to do additional paperwork. So I began to get really annoyed after a while, and I was beginning to ask people, although I'm not supposed to ask you this, why are you saying yes to this? And the answer that people gave was, I have no one else to talk to about this. This is something that really bothers me. I don't know how to handle disclosure. I don't know what to do, nobody has told me, and maybe if I talk to you, I'll figure something out, or maybe you'll tell me something that will inform me about what I should do, okay? And I think that was a huge learning in and of itself, the fact that you know, more than half of the people who took this questionnaire said, yes, I'm willing to invest this time and have this conversation with you. So what came out of that was this publication that was published uh, two or three years ago in the journal Qualitative Health Research, Serious Status Disclosure, Stigma, Resistance and Identity Management Among HIV Positive Gay Men in Ireland, and again the same people um, from Trinity and from St. James's. So again, I'm not going to go into the full analysis of what the people in those interviews told me, but I will uh, just highlight what they said their responses were when they disclosed that they were HIV positive within the gay community. So they told me that they were um, labeled as being promiscuous, as being criminals, as being lepers, as being unwanted and unclean, as being dangerous and dirty rather than sick, as being some kind of slut, and that was a really common one, or even as being an AIDS riddled whore. And these are really damaging labels. These are labels that would exclude the self from normal good society, and that was their purpose. It was social exclusion. So if you were to disclose your HIV status in the context of casual sex, you risked being labeled in this way and being excluded from the community as far as was possible. And of course, the other immediate risk of disclosure was that they wouldn't get to have sex. So 
Um, as one person said, you know, imagine telling everybody that you're HIV positive, the reaction would be, oh, just get out of here, you're crazy, don't touch me, I want to live. And this was, you know, two or three years ago when we already had a good sense about, you know, an undetectable viral load, meaning that people are, are you know, they can't transmit HIV, that they're um, sexually uninfectious. But that knowledge in the community was really lacking. So just because somebody disclosed didn't mean that they're going to have an immediate response about the realities of viral transmission. So disclosure therefore carried the risk of immediate sexual rejection and long-term social exclusion, and so people weren't disclosing. So there was a lot more to the analysis, and, and it's quite complex in a lot of ways, but the only point that I'll make about it is that disclosure or non-disclosure for the participants in the study was not about managing transmission risk. It wasn't a transmission reduction strategy. It was about managing their own identity and about managing their exposure to stigmatization. Three minutes, crap. Okay, so the last study I'll mention is just uh, one that we're looking at. Um, it's the data that we collected at that time, but we're reanalyzing it in a certain way to look at risk factors and protective factors for anxiety and depression among HIV-positive HIV gay men in the UK and Ireland. And so we're looking at um, the traditional risk factor, internalized HIV-related stigma and other forms of stigma. And we're also looking at um, HIV health optimism, which is the belief that medication will keep you well after infection, and HIV transmission opt optimism, which is the belief that you can't transmit HIV anymore. And I, I think something that I hear a lot is, you know, oh, gay men, they're fine. They, they take their medication. They, they go to the clinic when they're supposed to go. They're, they're doing okay. We don't need to worry about them. Um, but I, I think there's something more going on there. Like, can the, the knowledge that they're well, physically well, is that protecting them enough from HIV-related stigma that they're not suffering from anxiety and depression as a result of that. And so very quickly, um, what we found here is indeed that internalized HIV-related stigma was a huge predictor of anxiety. Indeed, it was the strongest and most significant, significant predictor of that, and the same for depression. Health optimism offered a little bit of protection, but not a whole lot, and oddly, transmission optimism provided no protection at all from anxiety or depression. And if you look at uh, the tool that we used, if you use that with the general population, what you would see that um, you would expect about 3% of people to have clinical symptoms of anxiety or depression, moderate or severe anxiety. Um, but in our sample of, of HIV-positive gay men, we found that 44.1% had 0.13% had clinical symptoms of depression, which is huge. And similarly with anxiety, in the general population, you would expect about 12.6% of people to have symptomatic anxiety. In our population of HIV positive gay men, 43.66%. Again, huge. Clinical anxiety and depression among this population that, for the most part, is going untreated. So what? What do we have? What do we know about that? So we have the highest transmission risk for any population in Ireland. We've got the highest prevalence rate for any population in Ireland. We have high rates of non-disclosure within the gay community because of stigmatization. We have a high risk of sexual and social rejection within the gay community and high rates of symptomatic depression and high rates of symptomatic anxiety. What are we doing about that? I think we're doing something about the transmission it's not perfect, but there's energy in the country about rapid testing, about community testing, about expanding resources. There's a lot of work to be done, but if I wanted to talk to people about this work, I'd know who to call and I'd know where the energy is. What do I think is being done about informing people about the prevalence of HIV in the gay community? I don't know if there's much in that area. And similarly with the other problems that I've identified through this research, and again, it's not just my research. These, these phenomena are, are readily identifiable in the literature. Why isn't something being done about this? So what should be done? Now what? Well, I just want to reflect a little bit on today. And Niall, you asked me to do that, so this is what I'm doing. So gay men in this country are the, the population most affected by HIV. Is that adequately reflected in the agenda for today? We have a lot of communities been talked about, and I don't want to dismiss the fact that they're affected by HIV, but is the recognition of the risk and the impact on gay men, is that recognition sufficient? I would just ask you to think about that. It struck me as something that should be talked about. The other thing I noticed when I looked at this was uh, something that was very problematic, and it was my name. And I wondered why it was on there. So as I've mentioned to you already, the work I did with HIV and with gay men was done when I was a postgraduate student. And I stopped being a student a number of years ago, and I'm no longer collecting data, and I stopped in 2014. Why was I the go-to person to talk about stigma in the gay community? And I was thinking about this, and I was like, why, 
who is the person that I would go to to talk about stigma in the gay community? Who is the person who's being employed by the NGO sector or by the HSC to work with people who are diagnosed with HIV in the gay community to, to work with you know, symptoms of anxiety, anxiety, depression, social exclusion, all of those things? Who is that person? And I couldn't think of that person. And I went to Erin to ask her about this, and I thought she might self-identify, because I love Erin and she does great work. But um, she didn't. She couldn't think of a person who was the go-to person working in this area at the moment. And I think Erin went to Susan to get another opinion, and it came back to me again, no, that there isn't somebody who's doing this work at the moment. I think that, that gap, that there isn't somebody dedicated, financed, resourced, paid, resourced, to do this work with this community in the country, within the, HI, within the NGO sector or within the HSC, that's a national disgrace. This is the population that is most affected by HIV in this country that is driving this phenomenon and it's not being resourced sufficiently. The other thing I was thinking about when I was reflecting on this uh, was about the study that we're launching today and I was on the, uh, the panel, uh, the steering committee, steering committee for the last couple of years, and I, I think it's a great piece of work, and I was really proud to be involved with that. I should actually say about the previous slide, I was delighted to be asked to speak here today, so thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was on the panel, the steering committee for that, and a few weeks ago, and we've been doing that work for a couple of years now, actually, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading the, a draft of the short report that's available at the back of the room, and it struck me, I was like, why don't we have a breakdown of this data for gay men living in this country? Why don't we have a, a breakdown for the gay respondents? And I realized we didn't ask about sexuality. And I think that's shocking. So I would bet good money that the majority of the respondents to this survey were gay men, but we can say absolutely nothing about their experiences because we didn't ask them who they were. We can't say anything about the community most affected by HIV in this country because we didn't ask. That's a stunning lack of Acknowledgement, it's a stunning lack of inquiry, it's a stunning oversight, and I hold up my hand and accept that I have full responsibility for that as well because I saw all of the drafts of the questionnaires and I didn't think of it until about three weeks ago. So I think we have just contributed to erasing the, voice, the voices of gay men living with HIV in this country because we didn't ask them. But still, it's a great report, so everyone should take a copy. <laughs> But when I was thinking about that, what struck me was somebody mentioned Foucault today, and I was reading a book about Foucault a number of years ago, and we were talking about this over lunch a little bit as well. I found it incredibly difficult to read, and it was kind of like queer theory, and I'm not really trained in that, so it was really hard. But I remembered a quote from it just out of the blue, and it was this quote, what our culture typically produces or recognizes as the truth about gay men and gay sex is not a disengaged, serene, or politically innocuous knowledge, but an array of contradictory, and it would seem, murderous knowledge effects, an illusory knowingness that is, which is not only distinct from knowledge, but is actually opposed to it, which is actually a form of ignorance insofar as it serves to conceal from the supposedly knowledgeable the nature of their own personal and political investments in the systematic misrecognition and abjection of homosexuality. And I, I won't try and paraphrase that because again, queer theory confuses me, but I think that was very applicable to our omission of the state of affairs in this country when it comes to HIV and gay men. So um, this is a quote from my own PhD, and I think it takes a certain form of narcissism to quote yourself in a presentation, but I'm going to do that. <laughs> Stigmatization and ART have combined to produce an epidemic within most gay communities where the infected are both silent and invisible. And I think that's particularly true here. And what I meant at that time is that because gay men don't become visibly unwell anymore, they can choose to not disclose because of stigmatization. And they become invisible within their own communities. And I, what I would ask uh, each of us here today, especially those of us who are working in policy or the NGO sector or legislation or you know, service provision, is to what degree are each of us complicit in perpetuating that silence and that invisibility? And I wonder why there aren't more gay men living with HIV working and recognized as experts within this sector. Why is it that so many of them are excluded? And I was talking about this with um, Thomas Strong, an anthropologist in Maynooth a couple of years ago, and he's a person living with HIV. And he said when he was volunteering in the Gay Health Network that once he disclosed that he was HIV positive, that was all that counted. He was then only seen as a person living with HIV. The fact that he had a PhD from one of the, le one of the leading universities in the world, Stanford, 
counted for nothing. His voice only could be heard as somebody living with HIV. And that's something I've struggled with myself as a person living with HIV and, and how I should cope with that. And I do remember when I was coming to the end of my PhD studies and I felt like I, I'd done a lot of my, my research training. I was, I was kind of done and I was getting some publications out there and I was teaching a bit at the time and, you know, I, I kind of felt like hot shit. And I remember one day I was leaving the Trinity Center for Health Sciences and I just delivered a psychology lecture to undergraduates and I felt pretty good. And I got a phone call from somebody who was organizing a, um, a well-funded um, research initiative into the experiences of gay men in this country, including gay men living with HIV. And he asked me if I would be involved. He thought my contribution would be really valuable. And I felt so praised because of that. And I should say this wasn't Niall, this was somebody else. Um, I felt so praised because of that. And I, I thought, my God, what do you want me to do? Is it like statistical analysis? Is it qualitative analysis? Do you want me to write up the results? Like anything, I'll, I'll just volunteer. What do you want me to do? And he said, no, 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 we don't want you to do anything. Um, we've just been told by our funders that we need somebody with HIV in our board. And we wanted you to be that body. And I felt so incredibly traumatized and deflated. And I, I said to that guy on the phone, I said, look, I'm going to think about it and get back to you. And I, I thought about it for a few days. And I called him up and I said, I'm sorry, I'm just too busy. I can't commit to it at this time. I'm just too busy with my PhD. And I wish I had just told him, go fuck yourself with your attitudes. Because I felt like some kind of infectious Bosco that they were just going to take out of a box and you know, document and photograph for a while as much as they needed me and then they would put me away again. And I, I think that's a problem that we have when we are living with HIV and we become experts in our area, but because we come out as being HIV positive, we're no longer seen as the kind of experts who can get paid for our work or, or thoroughly recognized for that. So I wonder, why are the people who are working in the HSE and in the NGO sector who are standing up and talking about their work uh, with gay men with HIV, where are the HIV positive gay men? employed in that sector, where are they and why aren't they there? So, do I have any, I, I'm almost finished, <laughs> just a second. So, my recommendations, I think I was supposed to come up with recommendations for how to fix this. I, I don't really have recommendations, but I would say don't carry on doing what you've been doing up to now. It's not good enough. I would say don't do some kind of ISLA guide intervention. And if any of you have heard of an ISLA guide intervention, um, that stands for it seemed like a good idea at the time. Don't just come up with something real quick and go off and do that because it'll fail. Do stop and think and think about the complexity of changing a culture, changing behavior, changing the, the health status of a community. And this is a, a diagram from the behavior change wheel and it just kind of points out all of the different things that we need to think about if we're developing an intervention and how they might interact and affect each other. And I, I think it's really important just to step back. I'm not recommending this model, but I think it's really important to step back and analyze what we've been doing up to this point and what we need to do to change and do that in a very careful way. So stop and think. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunity to, to reflect on, on Patrick's comments. Um, at the end, and let me also say th thank you, Patrick, for once again making such complex research so accessible to all of us in the room. That's, it's, it's always a, a joy to see you do that. Um, 